those that would wish to be clothed with the gospel armor. To do what? To stand against the fiery darts of Satan. He's coming first. And people need to be forearmed, forewarned and forearmed to handle that situation. Chapter 36, verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, verse 2, You know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And um, we know that in First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 6, that Christ became our Passover on that day. And what he's, he's giving them the information here, I will be crucified. This is not making them feel real good. They, they love him. And, um, and it's difficult that they understand that he will resurrect, and that in so doing he defeats death, which is to say the devil. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, verse 3 to continue. Then assembled together the chief priest, uh-oh, here's trouble, and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the place of the high priest who was called uh, Caiaphas, uh, Caiaphas rather. And Caiaphas means depression, and it's depressing to even hear his name, Caiaphas. Verse, he, he, was, he was not the head priest appointed by God, but by a Roman governor. Verse 4, And consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety, that's guile, and kill him. Now here he has healed. And here he has um, people paralyzed. Had them pick up their pallets and walk. He has kill, cured leprosy, just boom. He's let the blind see. These are all remarkable, wonderful miracles performed at the hand of God. And these churches wanted to, to destroy him. <clears throat> and there's nothing new in that. If you're teaching the real truth, if you're teaching God doesn't send out beggars, there are people in the religious communities that will try to, de to destroy you. That's, that's no biggie. That's all right. Christ always takes care of his own. But here uh, you have this group that are planning to, I mean, literally kill him. And, and certainly um, that lets you know the evilness that is in this world and the fact that the, the message God delivers in this, because through this, he paid that price that brings salvation for your sins when you repent. Um, this was written that it would come to pass in Psalms 2.2, 2, the why do the heathen raise, rage, and so forth, and they do. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 5. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people, because the people loved him. The majority did. They followed him. They had been fed in the wilderness. <clears throat> they had witnessed the healings. And, you know, they would have let this pass. But God has other plans. This was the time. This was the sacrificial lamb for this particular Passover. And God was going to bring it to pass to show you who's in control. And these wicked priests were not in control. God is in control. Why? Because he loves his children. He loves you. And he wanted that salvation put in place. So he himself, Emmanuel, God with us, prepared it. And, uh, and so it was. Man was going to let it slide. Let's see what, how our Father handles it. Verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, that's the house of dates, in the house of Simon the leper, uh, 7, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, uh, and poured it on his head. 
not his feet this time, this time it's his head, as he sat at meat, uh, at, at first being on his feet, but here, here only Judas at the first uh, objected. Why, he carried the money bag. Look how many object this time. Verse eight, but when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? Verse nine, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, why would Christ agree to this? She's anointing him for his burial. Verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? Question. For she hath wrought a good work upon me. Verse 11, for you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. Verse 12, for in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verse 13, listen carefully, verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done. He told, for a, be to, it shall be told for a memorial uh, of her. And so it is. <clears throat> in other words, look into the real truth of the matter. By her anointing this one for his burial, it's the greatest gift the poor have ever had in, in this world. It, they have freedom and release and blessings because he paid that price even for them. God is not a respecter of persons, poor, poor, and poorest, and rich, rich, and richest. There's no, no respecter of persons. He paid that price so that anyone that would believe upon him should not perish, but would have eternal life. And though the disciples, after all the teaching uh, that, and disciplining that he had done with them, did not see the value in this or recognize what would be in the future of this, that she was anointing him preparing for the greatest gift the poor have ever had in this world, even to this day. Verse 14, and people do remember her for that. You know, uh, you might say, well, uh, why wouldn't they do it as they did bury him? Are you kidding? The Kenites had crucified him, nailed him to a cross. And, and so it was. Um, there was no time for anointing. She took care of it. God bless her. Verse 14, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot um, went unto the chief priest. Iscariot in, is Karoth, it means a city builder. Why, why would this Judas, the money carrier, be called a city builder? And then you might remember back in Genesis chapter four, uh, verse, um, Oh, what, along about 17, somewhere along there, um, Cain was to be a builder of cities, his offspring was. Well, that makes you kind of wonder, doesn't it? But don't judge Judas. He did repent. He did love the Lord. He just thought that the Lord would not allow this to happen, that's to say the crucifixion, and he would have the money, uh, in as much as he was the banker, he would be the world banker because the kingdom would come in and he would be the banker thereof. Verse 15, and he said unto them, what will you give me and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. Um, 
And do you understand the prophecy that is being fulfilled there? It basically nails down this Sermon on the Mount. You see, it was written long ago exactly how this would go down and what even what that 30 pieces of silver would be used for. And again, I want to reemphasize, don't judge Judas. He did repent. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, you find that not that he just hanged himself. He was cut open from his Adam's apple to below his navel until all of his insides fell out. He had a lot of help hanging himself and dying that day. Why? Because the Kenites were not going to let him walk around and tell this story after he had repented. And that's why you will find uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 18, reading as it does. Um, this, this was arranged way back in Zechariah chapter 11, beginning with verse 7. Zechariah in the Old Testament. You won't have it. I'm going to read it to you. And it, and it reads, And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. Th this happens to be the poor of the flock. is um, it, It's really sheep traffickers in the Hebrew language. That's what the manuscripts say, you sheep traffickers. And... I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. God always does feed that flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Verse 9, Then said I, I will not feed you that, um, that dieth, let it die, and that that is cut off, let it be cut off, and let the rest eat every one the flesh of another destroy one another if you must okay but here we go with the instructions this is this is it 10 and i took my staff even beauty this is to say christ and i cut it asunder that i might break my covenant which i had made with all the people that's the house of judah and the house of israel Verse 11, and it was broken in that day. You want to know when Judah and Israel separated? This is it. And so the poor of the flock, that's the sheep traffickers that waited upon me, knew that it was the word of the Lord. They knew it. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. That happened to be the price of a slave, okay? But this was naturally re referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. 13, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was praised at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And that's exactly where they went. They purchased the potter's field outside the potter's gate where all the broken pottery is, is thrown, but also the burial of the poor that have no family and nobody cares about. And, and within this comes the fact that your body can be broken, your spirit, your soul. And when you turn to him, he can put it all back together. He can do that. And, and so it is, verse four, that's why his blood, money, purchased the price that you can be put back together. In other words, you have forgiveness because he paid that price. 14, then I cast asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And there you have it. That's when the separation came for the house of Israel and the house of Judah, speaking thereof. What happens then that this would relate to the Sermon on the Mount? I don't know. Let's find out. 15, And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. That's the Antichrist. For, lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, 
neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. When you saw me, you fed me. When I thirsted, you, you gave me water. Here, this one that's coming, this Antichrist, is not going to do any of that. He's going to take advantage of you. And here you can begin to see the warnings given in 24 concerning the appearance of the false one and how it goes down. He doesn't care about you. Verse 17, woe to the idle shepherd, the Antichrist, that leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm, and that sword is the voice of the living God. And upon his right eye, his arm shall be clean dried up. He will have no more power. And his right eye shall be utterly darkened. He will have no way to see or to deceive people when he's cast into the pit. So that 30 pieces of silver bought a lot and, and um, foretold of long ago in nailing the scriptures together so that we can have perfect understanding of God's plan that began from the, before the foundations of this earth age. Our Father knows exactly what he's doing and exactly what it is he wishes of you. So many questions are answered in this Sermon on the Mount when it relates back to the foundation thereof. Returning then to 26 in the, uh, Matthew in the next verse, please. Verse 16. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. That is to, to betray the Lord and Savior. 17. Now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And this is really the Passover supper before the real Passover day. Okay, that's why, that's why many people call it the Last Supper, and you have all these plaques of the twelve disciples. Uh, and it is not the Passover meal, it's the, la it's the supper before. It's, it's always given on the 14th, and at the end of that day comes the 15th, which is to say Passover, the Passover. Uh, note how this happens, 18, and he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. In other words, it was all arranged. I want you to take comfort from that to know that God has everything arranged. That's why you can put faith in his word. It's going to happen exactly as he declares it's going to. There's no ifs, ands, or maybes, no risk, no chance. When you go by his word, by the true light, with your oil filled, you can put total faith in the word of God that it's prearranged for those that obey, not otherwise, those that obey. Verse 19, and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them. And they made ready the Passover. Again, it, it was all set. How, how precious our Father is. Verse 20, Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And here, what happens when the evening comes? You go from the 14th to the 15th. And, and um, the 15th, of course, is the day, the first day after the spring equinox that Passover begins every year on the solar calendar. It does not miss. And so it is that that picture that you many have hanging on their wall was taking place just as that Passover day would begin. That is to say in the evening. God bless you. Day. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Chapter 26 of the great book of Matthew. We're going to pick it up here with verse 21 in a moment. Now, fantastic it is the Word of God that we know we're coming up on that time of Passover when the Passover lamb will be none other than the Savior himself. So 
Having said that, he's preparing the disciples for that time. He warned them. He said, this, we're, we're coming up on that time. And he prearranged a meeting place for the so-called Last Supper. And having completed that, we, we pick it up with verse 21, rather, as they continue that. Let's go with it. Word of wisdom from our Father in the precious name of the Savior. Uh, 26, Matthew, verse 21, and it reads, And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. What? It was the plan of God. You know, the, the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes had decided it was too dangerous to betray him at Passover because the people loved him. They loved him too much. They knew there would be much trouble. But then the Lord himself demanded, and it was his plan, that uh, Psalms 22 would be fulfilled and Christ would become that Passover lamb. Verse 22, when Christ made that statement to the twelve, and verse 22 reads, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. Let us say they were troubled. And began every one, that's each of them, to say unto him, Lord, is it I? They could not fathom that. They could not imagine. Verse 23, and he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. He knew who it was. Okay. Knew beforehand, as he knows all things beforehand. You should take assurance from that. He doesn't play guessing games. He doesn't play church. He knows exactly what's going down. It's all prearranged. Why? Because it's the Word of God. Verse 24, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It, it had been better, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. But where, where was it written that Christ would be betrayed? And that... Um, it was Psalms 22, that he would be delivered up, that the chief priest, even the words out of the chief priest's mouth, well recorded in Psalms 22, where you find in the Greek, the Hebrew rather, and Aramaic, um, the very words itself of, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli lama shabbatane, as it is written. Uh, Jesus never called our Father God, so to speak. He addressed him as Father. So he was quoting Psalms 22 where they would nail him to the cross, stretches his arms stretched out of socket, his mouth dry as a pot shirt. And he paid that price for you. Uh, that scripture had to be fulfilled. And that's why God was delivering up his own son here, whereby that sacrifice would be made. And you have salvation. He loves you that much. 25. Do you might, now stop and think a moment. Who was the son then? It was Emmanuel, God with us. So he, he, he was doing it himself for you, better said. Verse 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, entered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. He didn't accuse him. He didn't judge him. He said, You're the one that said that. But they both knew. Verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it. And he gave it to the disciples. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And of course, he's fulfilling here that great prophecy where, whereby his body would take the stripes and we would get the healing. And, and so it is that that Holy Communion took place. Verse 27, and he took the cup and he gave thanks. Always do that. He gave thanks to what? To the Father. And he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament. Of what? Of the New Testament. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. <clears throat> In other words, it washes you white as snow. When you repent, it paid the price. It's not free. 
It cost him an awesome price. And don't ever forget it. To always thank him for it and give thanks for him that he set this in place whereby we can take advantage of that when we fall short miserably on repentance. <clears throat> You're washed uh, white as snow and have that new start in life. Uh, that's what the New Testament is, and he brought that forth. Uh, it was nailed to the cross, uh, and, and so it is. Uh, verse 29, to continue. <clears throat> but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And, and so it is that uh, he, he would not. And then in verse 30, And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Do you know what hymns they would sing at this time? It was Passover. And they would sing the hymns as they are written in um, 115, Psalms 115, 116, and 117, which are known as the Hallelujah Psalms. Uh, what does Hallelujah in the Hebrew tongue mean? It means praise ye the Lord. And so we pick it up then, and uh, you're not going to have it, but I'll read. We're going to just cover a little bit. I'm not going to read all of it. Verse, Psalms 115 reads, verse 1, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake, wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in heavens, is, is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And then when you skip on to the 18th verse of that, it says, but we will bless the Lord with the time from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. That's hallelujah. That's what praise the Lord means. And then Psalms 116, verse 1, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Don't, don't ever forget that. And, and then skipping to the last, um, how precious these psalms are, you can read them for yourself. The cup of salvation, has the price has been paid. And um, we read the last verse of, of this 116th psalm. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. This is what they sang that day after having taken communion. And 117 is the shortest of all. It simply reads in verse 1, O praise the Lord, all ye nations, praise him, all you people. Verse 2, For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. That truth is so precious. You know, once one gains the truth of what's truly happening in this world, no one, it's going to separate you from that. That's why you can praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Because he gives us that truth. And it is with us evermore. And no one, no one can, well, how do I gain that truth? From his word. It's that simple. Naturally, it comes from him. And he sent you this letter explaining to you how to get it done. So these are the hymns they sang when they finished that communion. And as they would continue on. Then returning, if we may, to verse 31 of chapter 26. And then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the sheep of the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Now, where, where would that be written? Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. And Zechariah 13, 7 reads, verse 7, you won't have it, I'll read it for you. Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And I will turn mine hand 
upon the little ones. I'm, I'm, he always takes care of the little ones. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Two thirds will die spiritually, not, not physically, spiritually. Why? They're deceived, misled, mistaught. Verse 9, And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, because they search for truth, and I will hear them. I will say, This is my people. And they shall say, The Lord is my God. Again, he calls them lo ami, not, I'm calls them ami, not lo ami which means not my people. Father loves his children. The truth is precious. He paid an awesome price to alleviate from us the sins of this world on repentance and giving us the truth whereby when you feed the flock this truth, they're never going to part from it. They may be uh, dissuaded here, there, and yon, but you will never take the truth away from them. They will hang on to it. They will live by it and live for it. Why? They're children of the living God. That third is going through the fire of deception and the works of the devil himself. Verse 32, back in uh, chapter 26 of the great book of Matthew reads, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. They should have marked that down. He was going to be crucified, but he said, after I am risen. And certainly that resurrection would take place. This, I feel the disciples were put through quite a bit for our edification today so that you would not make the same mistakes. Let's see if we can learn something from that. Verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Now here, here is the one that uh, was not afraid of confrontation. As a matter of fact, when Christ is delivered up, uh, Peter will draw his sword and he will lob an ear right off of Malchus, one of the servants of, of the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> you know, it takes a pretty good swordsman to accomplish that. You can, <clears throat> you can crack a skull, but to just slice off an ear, that takes some swordsmanship. So you, you know that he was one brave man, but he will deny Christ as Christ will tell him. I, I feel, and yet Christ will use him to establish the church. Uh, Peter in the Greek tongue, Petro, means rock, and that was the rock. Not, not the solid rock, immovable, which is Christ, but a movable rock or a chip off the old block, you might say. Peter would found the church, and so it would be that he would recover and lead that 120 in the first chapter of Acts to, to serve the living God. But Peter, he said, I, I will never, never. 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. This had to hurt Peter. It had to hurt him bad, deep. Verse 35, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. They were hanging right tough with him. What did the scripture say? You read it back in Zechariah chapter 13. Uh, you you uh, smite the shepherd and the sheep are going to scatter. It had to come to pass that way. And again, I'm going to say these were brave men. And they were armed. They could have handled that situation quite handily. But scripture had to be fulfilled so that you today could have salvation. Verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, this wine press, and he said unto his, the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. You, you um, uh, stay here. 
and uh, verse 37, and he took with him Peter and the two sons Zebedee, that'd be James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Why was he sorrowful? Because of something he must do to the very children. And this is Emmanuel, God with us. And they are his children. Verse 38, many people think he's talking about the crucifixion. He's not. We'll document that. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death, even as it's coming. Tarry ye here and watch with me. He, he made watchmen of them. When you're put on duty as a watchman, then you'd better watch. We're in the end times. There are many things that are transpiring that you need to be aware of, and you need to be awake, and you need to be watching, because prophecy is coming to pass almost faster than you can, can um, adhere to or to keep up with. Uh, and then verse 39 to continue. And he went a little further. And he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And, and again, here, here we go with, um, with he saying this. What, what cup is he talking about? And, and um, you, you can find that cup in, in um, Isaiah chapter 51. And, um, and it is written there in, in 17. I'm going to read it for you. Isaiah 51, verse 17. It's good that you know this cup, what he's ta the cup he's speaking of. 17. Awake, awake, and stand up, O Jerusalem which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There's seven of them. Seven cups of wrath. They're called the veil, the vials. And the book of Revelation makes it very clear that those vials are made up the wrath of God. And is there some other way because many people are going to be disappointed. People gnashing their teeth, praying for mountains to fall on them. Why? They're going to worship Satan. And then being good Christians, they feel, though they're not good Christians, or they would have studied God's Word and have maintained the truth and not been deceived by the Antichrist. They pray for mountains. They're too ashamed to face the true Christ, and they pray for mountains to fall on them. What a bitter cup. But you see, ultimately, that tough love through the millennium, I feel, will save many souls that never had an opportunity to really know the truth. But that's why that cup must be poured out. It's the tough love of the living God. Verse 18, there is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand and all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are come upon thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? This cup. Christ was desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword by whom shall... but. By whom shall I comfort thee? And of course the answer is Christ. The desolation it comes from the desolator. Who is the desolator? The desolator, of course, as it's written in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 7, is none other than the Antichrist himself. And, and naturally, Satan is the, destruct, the destroyer, which that's what destruction comes from. Don't be deceived by him. Many people are being set up, unfortunately, to walk that path right into his camp when they listen to man instead of studying the Word of God. Verse 20, Thy sons have fainted. 
they lie at the head of all the streets. As a wild bull in a net, they are full of the fury of the Lord and rebuke of thy God. Father it pra practices tough love. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not yet, but not with wine. That's not the cup. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord that and thy God that uh, pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Now, this, this is God's elect. You're, you are spared. You don't know how precious that is, that you as a watchman continue to watch. You absorb the truth. You take it to your heart. You live it. One more verse. But I will put into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, Bow down that we may go over, and thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that went over. <clears throat> they use you for a walking mat. He said, I, I'm keeping score, and God is keeping score. You don't have to worry about that. You know, there will be many things said. You don't have to worry about it. Vengeance belongeth to our Heavenly Father. At the same time, know that that cup, Christ was, is there another way that we can bring in salvation without practicing such tough love? Isn't it a shame that in the love and tenderness that he taught on how to accept salvation, that traditions of men make void that word by saying, you don't have to read God's word. You don't have to understand it. After all, you're not going to be here. You're going to be gone. And, and people will listen to a man like that over God, over he that paid the price, rather than staying a watchman and observing to see that God's word comes to pass as it is written. Now let's return to chapter 26. We'll pick it up with the next verse, verse 40. And it reads, And he cometh into the, uh, unto the disciples, and he findeth them asleep. And he said unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? This is symbolic, beloved, and this is why you can see Peter's being put through this for our sake. What is that hour? It's the hour of temptation. It's the same hour you will read of in Revelation chapter 17, when the five-month period as it is shortened to that the Antichrist will be walking upon this earth, will be here, that uh, you, you don't go to sleep while that's happening. You pay attention. You read the signs that God gives us, both in the Word and in the heavens, to know and to understand what is transpiring, whereby you don't go to sleep on watch, that you don't succumb to the hour of temptation, because I hope and I pray that you do not find Satan tempting, but you rather, when you see him abuse the children of God, that you find him to be an abomination when he misleads playing church, even in these end times that your righteous indignation stands up and takes note. That hour is coming. 41, what did he say? Watch and pray. It's important that you enter not into temptation. Don't let that hour take you. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is true. Flesh is weak, but the spirit, when it is willing, will conquer the flesh. It will let it be boss in your life. Do you understand that is the prime root of real discipline? It's whether you can discipline yourself, but you will never be successful at it until you allow the spirit to override the flesh, whereby spirit is in charge and the flesh is an underling. It takes orders from the spiritual man, self. And that's the way it goes, and that's the way you overcome the ways of the world. Flesh is weak, 
And you might as well get used to that fact. But, and and that's, that's as God created us. It, it, as it is written in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it grieved God that he had now made man flesh also. Because well, flesh is weak. And, and so it is. So don't make any excuses for it. But be, be, strong, be strong because of it, because you have the inner man, boss, he takes over. That is to say, yourself in serving God, you do not go to sleep on watch and you do not fall to the hour of temptation. You do not find Satan to be tempting none whatsoever. Verse 42 to continue. He went away again the second time and prayed and saying, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And so it is that, uh, in other words, if, if this must be, then let it be. And certainly it was, because um, that cup of wrath, all seven of them are going to be poured out as the great book of Re Revelation so declares. But, but no one understand this. Not one ounce, not one little bit of the wrath of God falls upon those he loves. This is why he gave us example after example throughout the word of God, whereby you're not, you're not fearful of, of the word of God or of God himself because of the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they weren't singed. They weren't harmed seven times hotter than necessary the fire was. And Christ walked with them, and he was their savior and their protection. And they were not harmed, not even, you couldn't even smell smoke on them. So therefore, God brings his own through, even through the cups of wrath. You don't have to worry about them, those vials. You are immune to it. Why? Because you are a child of the living God. As it stated when I read from the Old Testament, a third that's God's election will pass right on through. No sweat, no worry. He takes care of his own. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 43. And he came and he found them asleep again. How about that? For their eyes were heavy. And again, the flesh is weak. Verse 44. And he left them and went away again and prayed... Um, the third time, saying the same words. This is why that you will hear me oft times say, if you put out a fleece to God, a request, let it be three times. If you fail the first time, find out what went wrong, fix it, and pray to the Father and go the second time. And the second time, God doesn't like a quitter. So find out what went wrong and fix it. And then go that second time, but if it fails then the third time, then no God is telling you, I want you to go a different direction. You go a different way. This is the way it is. It is written, and so it is. Verse 45. Then cometh he, cometh he to his disciples, and he saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. It is a shame that they did go to sleep on watch. Don't uh, see that you don't. 46, rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And certainly you could almost hear the footsteps coming down the path of old Judas uh, with a ragtag army, not of the Roman army, but of little old temple guards and floor sweepers and what have you, sticks and, you know, the, with the sticks and rakes and brooms that these people had, Peter could have, he will draw his sword and he will dear dear de ear one of them. You know, they are they have lack of hearing. They don't hear the truth, but yet uh, Christ said, no, that's enough. And in another place in John, I believe it is, he healed that ear. But 
he's about to be betrayed. That is something that I, uh, that you must not even entertain the thought that you would ever do that. That you would betray the Lord and Savior after what he has done for you. And even putting yourself in Judas's boots, and I would not wish to do that, but I always have felt that Judas believed that the Lord was God with us, and that rather than being crucified, that he would call down a thousand angels and take over the world, and Judas would hold the bank, the money bag for the whole world. But he was so very wrong that he paid the price and collected the price that would purchase the potter's field outside the potter's gate where old broken pottery even to this day bodies that is to say human beings broken downhearted Christ can put them back together that 30 pieces of silver paid for that that 30 pieces of silver bought it, it is our freedom and and uh, our right to serve him but he We're going to pick it up here in verse 47 in a moment. Christ has just gone to Gethsemane. That's where the oil press is. And, and um, he took three with him. They went to sleep on him. And it had to do with the hour of temptation. Don't ever go to sleep on watch. And don't ever go to sleep when the hour of temptation especially is about to happen or does happen. For that is when the false one arrives, and you, there can be no sleeping at that time, spiritually speaking. You must be alert, on guard, and be armed with the Word of God, <clears throat> whereby you understand what's about to transpire. And then um, he, finding them asleep again, said it's time to go. So we pick it up in verse 47. Judas is already approaching. You can almost hear the footsteps to, be, to betray him. With the word of wisdom, chapter 26, verse 47, the great book of Matthew, and it reads, uh, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from, notice where they're from, from the chief priest and elders of the people. Not the Roman army. This, this is a bunch of misfits with rakes and sticks. Uh, I, I dare say the 12 could have drawn swords, as Peter will draw his here in a moment and lob off an ear. They could have put the whole bunch on the run. But it was God's word that it was time for the betrayal, <clears throat> and it was time that the Lamb of God would be the Passover of all Passovers. As a matter of fact, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover, the Lamb. Verse 48, to continue. Now, he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. Verse 49, and forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. A kiss, a kiss of betrayal, the kiss of death, so to speak. Verse 50, and Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? And then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. You know, it's um, always amazing that uh, Father always goes by the word. Psalms 49 and, and 41, 9. And what does it say in Psalms 41, 9? It says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, he dipped at the same time, hath lifted up his heel against me. He betrayed me. <clears throat> Verse 10, But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, you resurrect me again after this crucifixion, that I may requiet them. Vengeance belongeth to the Lord. Verse 11, By this I know that thou favorest me, 
because mine enemy doth not triumph over me, never has, never shall. And as for me, thou upholdest me in mine integrity, and settest me before thy face forever. How long? Forever. 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen. So there he was betrayed, but each act foretold of long ago in the prophets of exactly how it would come to pass. All you have to do is to be familiar with it and be aware. What should that do for you? It should strengthen you. For as it is written, it's going to come to pass that way. Reading these scriptures, the prophecy is like reading tomorrow's newspaper. It keeps you informed of what's about to go down, how it's going to happen. It always comes to pass exactly as it's written. You ever read it? Returning then to chapter 26, the great book of Matthew, verse 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, this would be Peter, and drew his sword. Yeah, they, were, they were armed, I mean big time, and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. And naturally this would be, as you would learn in John chapter 18, verse 10, this was Peter and the sword, the the ear came off from a servant called Malchus. Uh, and naturally there Christ would say enough and he reached out and he healed the ear. Uh, this is um, to let you know it was dangerous on the paths that the disciples walked. And always be wise enough to know you can handle whatever situation might come up. The disciples could. They made it real fine. They were well taught and well trained, but what you have to know is when to pull the spiritual sword, which is the tongue of the Lord, which is to say the word of God, and the actual sword. Verse 52, Christ answers, Then said Jesus unto him, speaking to Peter, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. In other words, um, in, in the end times, we fight a spiritual war. And without this gospel armor on to stand against the fiery darts of Satan, you'd be in a heap of hurt. But you have power over the enemy, both spiritually and physically, when you use what God put inside your forehead. That's to say your brain, 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father? And he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Do you, do you think that just above our heads, if I so wanted, I could put a stop to this? This should always remind you of dimensions. And the fact that the reason flesh and blood can't enter heaven, it's a different dimension. You don't know what's just above your head. Remember Elisha and his armor bearer when there was a whole army before them and Elisha says, let's get them. And the armor bearer says, whoa, there's just two of us basically. And Elisha prayed to God that he would open the servant's eyes to the dimension that was just above them. There was a whole army and that army frightened the enemy to, uh, to um, out of their wits and put them on the run. So uh, our Father is in charge. That's why when you use what's in your forehead and you're familiar with the dimensions and the Word of God, then you can better understand why it is said uh, that if you are one of God's set-aside ones, they're called elect or saints, uh, then your angel has the face of God at any moment, meaning uh, God is informed. And uh, it is written, and the elect are going to bring to pass what is written. That's who God utilizes to do that. That does not make us better than anyone else. It simply means we're servants of the living God. <clears throat> so he's on, put, put the sword away. I've got a whole army at my disposal if I wanted that. 
verse 54, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that um, thus <coughs> it must be? And of course, he's speaking of Isaiah chapter 53. And, um, and that's where it is written concerning our Father and concerning the Word. In verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is besought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her sharers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. That had to come to pass, and that's what he was telling him. It's written. It's got to happen that way. Verse 55. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, are you come out? This is that ragtag army. Are you come out as against a thief? With swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. I was there. I did it openly. I didn't hide anything. And that's the reason they didn't. They were afraid of the people because the people loved the Lord. Verse 56. But all this was done that the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And so it was that the shepherd was smitten and the sheep scattered. But at the same time, he stood alone. 57, and they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas. Caiaphas means depression, and boy, it depresses you to even hear his name. The high priest, why? Because he wasn't a high priest appointed by God. He was a high priest appointed by a Roman governor. The high priest were with more the scribes and the elders were assembled. They were all right there, muckety ducks from the church. 58, and Peter followed him afar off into the high priest uh, uh, palace and, um, and went in, and they sat with the servants to see the end. Verse 59, and the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses. Underline that in your mind. Not truth. What kind of church is this? They sought out liars, false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. This, this makes you wonder, you know, how, how, what jealousy can do because Jesus was healing people, answering prayers, God's very touch on the people. They couldn't do that. He'd gone into their temple, overturned the, the day dove might infested doves, released them, turned over the money tables where they had taken the house of prayer and made it a den of thieves. And um, naturally, this, this upset them. But the extent they will go to to create murder, a church that will create murder is no church. But you know something? A church that will not do its homework and will cause spiritual bodies to be so-called murdered, that means to be deceived where they worship Satan instead of Christ, that's a spiritual suicide in a sense. How, how much better are they, if, though they do it secretly or in ignorance or whatever, to lead them to the false Messiah? Which is different? Which is better? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad our Father is the judge. Verse 60. They couldn't find any false witnesses, but 60, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. Now, are these true? No, they're false witnesses. 61, what did they say? And they said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now, think about that a moment. That's a lie. That is a bold-faced lie. And, and you might say, well, well how, how can you say that is a bold-faced lie? Because it is. That's not what Christ said. You'll find it in, um, in the book of John. 
In chapter 2, what, what did Christ say there? Christ said in verse 19 of chapter 2 of St. John, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it. He didn't say he was going to destroy it. He said, you destroy it. And naturally, how could Christ rebuild the temple in three days? Because he would resurrect from the dead, and the many-membered body of Christ is the temple. That's, he is the king, kingdom. His kingdom comes when he resurrected. He's the king, and this earth is his dominion. And the many-membered body make up uh, the very true temple of the living God. But you see, they're lying. He did not say that. He did not say, I will destroy the temple, or I can destroy the temple. He said, if you were to destroy the temple, I can raise it up in three days, meaning his body in the memory, many-membered body. But that's what they utilized to, 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 to lie, 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answereth thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? And um, he didn't answer. Why? He's fulfilling Scripture even as it said. 63. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. 64, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, you're the one that said it, not me. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Uh, you're the one that said it, but you this is what you will observe. And, and naturally, um, this will really upset old Caiaphas. He won't be depressed. He'll, he'll be super depressed now. 65, then the high priest rent his clothing, his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What? Further need have we to of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Well, it wasn't blasphemy, it was a true fact. Really a true fact. Verse 66. What think ye? Question. They answered and said, He is guilty of death. A nice bunch of religious folks. Thank God Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality, it's real life. Verse 67, then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. This just really hurts. It really bothers me. Do you know what they were saying? 68, saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee, hidden him from behind? You know. Uh, there's a day of accounting coming, and vengeance belongs to God. But I would sure like to have these jokers myself. I, I would like to have them in the millennium. I really would. I would like to give them a little discipline in an orderly way. Verse, but don't worry. Christ will take care of it. They'll get everything they've got coming to them. That's the way God operates. You always get everything you've got coming to you, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. Verse 69. I mean, you can count on it. That's the way it is. 69 reads, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. Verse 70, And he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. I mean, here he was, he was dressed as one of them. His, his uh, speech uh, betrayed him. He had the same dialect of a Nazarene. Verse 71, And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. They're country people. I can tell by looking at them. 
Remember what Christ said Peter would do. He would deny him thrice before the cock would crow. 72, and again he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. I, I know this would, would tear Peter up later. And you know something? I, I want you to just put everything out of gear for a moment. It's real easy to accuse Peter of saying, well, he denied the Lord. No, think about it. When they came to get the Lord, he drew a sword and lobbed an ear off. I mean, he was ready to fight. He, he's, Peter was no coward. Therefore, I feel God did this to Peter for our benefit so that you don't deny him. There is no way at the second advent that you're going to deny the true Christ. You're going to stand against the false one, but in no way are you going to deny Jesus the Christ. You're going to admit that you're one of his own. You're going to admit that you are part of that family. You are going to be staunch in the way you stand and do spiritual warfare with the enemy. And I feel in a way that that's why Peter was put through this, was to set an example for us that we know I'm never going to go through that shame. I'm going to make a stand and stand spiritually. So don't be too hard on Peter through this. He was a warrior and he documented it. But Christ teaches in many mysterious ways. Let's go with the next verse, verse 73. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. I can tell by your dialect that you're a country boy from Nazareth. <clears throat> How far did Peter go this time? 74. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. What, what, a, what a terrible moment for this strong one that he went through this. Um, it does not, you know, it's painful to think that he went through this to teach us a lesson that you are going to stand and you're never going to deny the Lord Jesus Christ under any conditions. It is an honor to wear the badge of Christian. I mean, you don't have to have a badge. People can look at you and know you're a Christian, a Christ man, and never be ashamed of that fact. For it is the living word and it is the word eternal and all that do not align with that will not be in the eternity. They will be gone. So it is a wonderful thing to stand for he who paid such an awesome price that we have the honor of standing for, with, and about him. Next verse, please, verse 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus which said unto him, Behold, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Uh, and, you know, I, I know it had to hurt him terribly. There was no way he felt he could would do that. But he did. But then was he not fulfilling the word of Christ? Yes, he was, because... Christ knew that that would happen exactly that way. And the emotions controlled by Peter as a teaching tool for us today. It is a lesson that could be very bitterly earned if you were to fall out of step, if you were not to stand. That would be an awesome thing. There will be many good, honest, and honorable people who claim to be Christians that have not been taught that the false one comes first. And they will literally be too ashamed to face Christ when they realize that he returns at the second advent and they've been in the sack with Satan. 
they just they, they it will be destructive to them they'll pray for mountains to fall on them you, you, this is why you want to learn this lesson real good you do not want to go there with dignity pride and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ you will make that stand and you will do it proudly you will wear that smile and that declaration with dignity of Christ man, woman or child, one of God's elect, very elect, that make a stand against false teachings, false witnesses. You know what the word says. It is written. It will come to pass as it is written. There need be no surprises for you. You know exactly how it's going down. So don't be edged into making mistakes when God would put an honorable man like Peter through this so that you wouldn't fall. So think about it. Pray about it. Peter wept bitterly, and he should have. He did. He was disappointed in himself. But yet, Christ will pick him up, and he will establish the church through this self-same one.